Hey everybody, it's Morgan from Podcast of the Dragon. I am back to do yet another video about the Wheel of Time on Prime. Before I go any further, I am going to ask you to like my video and subscribe to my channel. I won't ask you to hit the announcement bell or whatever, because I never do. Why would I ask you to do something that I wouldn't do? But yeah, if you could like and subscribe, that would help me out. Um, this is a very early channel, and obviously I'm just doing it to supplement my podcast, but it's an awful lot of fun, and I would love for more people to find my videos. So yeah, if you could do that for me, that would be great. So I've already done my first viewing React video for the Wheel of Time on Prime teaser trailer. Um, and now, like a lot of people, I've gone back and watched it 50 million times, or maybe not quite that many times, but enough times, and have kind of like drawn out a whole bunch more meaning and am now wanting to do a much more thorough breakdown. So before I dig into it, I am going to indulge and watch the trailer one last time. So bear with me there. And, uh, See if I smile just as much the 50th time I watch it as I did the first. The wheel of time turns. And ages come and pass. Leaving memories that become legend. power inside you. All over the world there are different names for it. But it's one thing. One power. And women who can touch it. We protect the world. face, an heartbreak, the wheel keeps turning, the dark one is coming for your friends, the last battle is coming, the only thing that matters is what you do. Whatever happens now, there's no turning back. So, that doesn't get old. Um, it's really, really amazing. I'm going to scrub through this video occasionally if I need to come up with talking points. Um, but first things first, I find that the timing of the video is incredible. Um, I love the music. I already said that in my original React video. And the way that they just you know, cut everything and like when they do the, you know, Wheel of Time turns and ages come and pass and it's just sort of like you get the the camera on Rand when she says come, and then the camera on um, Nine Eve when she says pass. Come and pass. The way they time with the music and just th the cuts are great. Um, I really, really appreciate that. Uh, I don't know a ton about film, but I'm learning as I'm starting to do this, and I really appreciate it. I think that it's beautifully done. I love the special effects. I think the channeling looks great. More and more, I feel like the characters are really an embodiment of the people. The scene with the three boys, where they're in the Wine Spring Inn, they just, they look so genuine. They so look like the boys. The way that they're interacting, it's like Rand looks a little bit shy and just really sweet. Matt looks so happy-go-lucky, so joyful, and Perrin just looks a little bit more solemn, but also like his friends are just able to help him relax and have a good time. I love this little clip from Inside the Wine Spring Inn. 
and also it looks like a terrible fire hazard. All of those candles burning in the candle, I guess those are candelabra, but I know that that's the way they used to do things, but we went without power for three days last winter when there was a horrible ice storm and we had to burn a lot of candles and holy crap, the amount of like smoke and the soot on the walls and just how terrible it was to breathe at all. I look at that and it's just, I can't even imagine having to live with that every day. Also, whenever Robert Jordan says that candles gave a good light, lies, absolute lies. And I don't care how mirrored they were. We tried that, lies. Anyway, this beginning bit with Nynaeve pushing Egwene off the cliff. When I first looked at that, I was like, what is this? I didn't get it because I was kind of like, oh, are they doing the fleeing from Shatter Logoth and it's her, Egwene and Nynaeve are together rather than, you know, Egwene and Perrin. And so Nynaeve is, you know, being like, oh, we've got to get across the RNL, push, be strong. And then... I watched Daniel Green's breakdown video before I'm like, I don't want to watch any more of other people's breakdown videos until I do my own. And he mentioned this being a rite of passage. And once I saw that, I was like, duh, of course it is. And once I saw that, I was like, I love this. This is another one of those things that makes this kind of wheel of time for the 21st century, because it's like, Egwene is reaching womanhood and it's not, oh, she's putting her hair in a braid and it says that she's old enough to get married. It's like she has to do a bravery right, you know, and for, you know, a girl to reach womanhood and have to do this courage ritual of leaping off the, I believe Madeline Madden said it was a 12 meter cliff. So to leap off a 12 meter cliff and into water that looks real cold. The type of water that gets that color, there's a, a river that runs down Mount Hood toward Portland that gets that color on some stretches of it, and it's cold. That water... So this whole little bit where she does this and comes up in the pool of water, and once I saw, you know, she rises up, and I'm guessing it's probably something where she's, you know, goes down the stream, you know, jumps off the cliff, swims down the, the stream, and then maybe, like, swims into an underground cave or something, and then comes up in the water through the paint, and it's like, you're a woman now. And then the foreshadowing with all of the paint. What I love best about this beyond the fact that it's gorgeous foreshadowing, is the way that they chose to lay the colors. So it's like, you know, all the paints on her face. The fact that it's red, white, and yellow seems to be what got all over her face. You know, so red to counterbalance Rand. You know, I don't feel like saying that Egwene is just red Aja is fair, because I feel like she... You know, it's not necessarily anti-Rand. I just feel like she counterbalances him, you know, the flame to his fang. And that, you know, they are kind of like the celestial twins that work together. Um, and, you know, work together and yet against each other. And so it's not that she's anti-male channeler, but it does, the red does work as a balance to say, you know, she will balance him. The white... For her logic, because one of the things I love the most about her is her logic. The yellow for the fact that she heals, because she heals the tower. And then the green is not so much on her, but off to the side, because that's like her chosen Aja. You know, and then more of the brown, the gray, and the blue off in the back. But it's just beautiful the way that it's done. And I love how they do the trailer where it's just sort of like, you know, they got the memories where the warder is crying um, and then become legend and Egwene rises up from the water and opens her eyes and that does so many things right there. For one thing, it's like, oh, are they making this look like Egwene's going to be the hero of the story? Which, great, if so. I mean, it already it kind of looks like from some of the pictures that... 
they're making Egwene have, you know, she's Moraine is her new mentor, which is, you know, the way it went anyway, because Egwene chose. Egwene is like, I am going to choose to go on this adventure. And I don't know if it's going to be like that with this. Um, this seems like a much more frantic thing. And with how horrifying this winter night, I mean, the horror of winter night, as we see this whole terrible scene of all of these different monsters and the utter destruction. I mean, I'm wondering if anybody is going to survive winter night except for our crew of five. Um, and I'm also wondering if this scene where you've got Nynaeve holding a knife, is she pulling it on lawn? Is this like the front and the back? And I don't know if that's necessarily true because you would think that lawn would be lit up with fire because of the way that the juxtaposition of the shot, but the knife looks right. So I don't know. But anyway, I like the idea of making it seem like Egwene is the hero. And the scene of her going through the water down the stream in a river contained by two banks as she's just floating down and the voiceover of Moraine talking, being like, the power inside you, you know, all over the world, there's different names for it, but it's one thing, one power, and women who can touch it protect the world. And she's just, she's the river contained by the banks, and then she rises up, bathed in these colors, and it's just, it's wonderful. And then you're getting the contrast with Loghain, and these scenes with Loghain are so cool because you look and you see like they're showing when like it looks like they're showing when someone's holding the one power so you can see like the taint you can totally see it which is awesome like cool that they would do that that they would show that yes corruption in action like i think that that's great and these special effects like you know totally like doing mind blast there. Um, I'm a I'm a big fan of the video game series Dragon Age. That's like my other nerdery that I'm super involved in. And Dragon Age borrowed liberally from the Wheel of Time. And so I am looking at that and being like that force blast of like air that, you know, I'm assuming killed at least one Aes Sedai. And that's why the warder is crying. Um, it's so great beautiful theatrics and i really really appreciate it um i'm really enjoying how lovely that is they did such a good job focusing on the women to make it very interesting i love how when maureen's voiceover where it's like you know women who can touch it protect the world and they do the women and it shoots from below and looks up at the red aja and it's like they just look fierce. It's like all of these fierce queens, like, you know, you're not going to mess with them. And then, you know, Liana making her fierce face as she bangs her staff. And Swan, who I love. Not sure if I'm a fan of her outfit. I can't decide, you know, because I don't know that I care for, like, having that inside of her collar be, like, the seven stripes. But... Sophie Okonedo, oh my god, she's great. Like, you only get this small little line of hers. The last battle is coming. The only thing that matters is what you do. And I don't claim to be an expert in accents of any kind whatsoever, but I am an Anglophile. And listening to her accent, I'm like, I recognize that she's got this London accent, and it's got a work. A bit of a working class sound to it which makes it so perfect for her to play swan because i did a little bit of research on rosamund pike and she was also born in london but like to opera singers and went to boarding school and stuff like that so it's like her being moraine as like the the royal family of kyrian versus swan being the working fisherman's daughter like so her just i felt like that just nailed the character right there, you know, and having, you know, an accent might not seem like it would be that much, but it's just, just little things. I don't know. To have just the regalness and bearing and just the poise and power, like that woman has power. 
but also the the earthiness it's something that says you know i come from you know basically nowhere or nothing you know and i rose to become the most powerful woman in the world and she just looks incredible and i am super impressed with her and so excited to see her in this role and while i can't decide whether i like swan's outfit necessarily i do like the neutral coloring that she has where she's you know in her kind of cream colored outfit and also that liana wears a sort of neutral type coloring and i love that they decided to just go with people wear their Aja colors, which, you know, people do a lot in the Wheel of Time, but they don't always do it. And so their shawls are always depicting them because people don't always wear their Aja colors. So just having them be like, everybody's going to wear their Aja colors. And if you look at all of these different women, you know, there are different styles. Like you see a lot of these different women where several of them have like these dresses that are very broad at the shoulders or, you know, just different types of cuts of dresses where you're like, okay, so these must be from different types of lands. Like they were really trying to get different regional clothing styles. So you can say there are representatives of, you know, seven different nations here, seven different types of clothing or who knows, I just pulled that number out, you know, but... But yeah, just I love the costuming and just going with the, hey, we'll color code it and, you know, it, we'll just say that, hey, it's a tradition. This is what you do. Your race, I said, I, you wear the color of your Aja and that's just what it is. Um, unless you're going incognito or something. The Hall of the Tower being so small. I like it. I really like it. I think that it's... I don't know, the intimacy of it? Because it's like you hear the Hall of the Tower and you're imagining something big bigger like you know the hall of the congress or daniel's daniel green's um video mentioned like the senate chambers or something but it's sort of like yeah it is only 21 people tw tw 21 people 23 people when you include both the omerlin and the keeper but you know three sitters from each of seven ajas that's not really that many people to have to seat and so it doesn't really need a big chamber and while the idea is to have people be able to come in and sit in the Hall of the Tower and view the proceedings, having it be this kind of like railed gallery thing that they've got going on, I think that works really well. And then doing this wonderful superimposed thing, particularly after Michael McElriton is saying about how even if you're in pain and heartbreak and everything, the wheel keeps turning and doing the, the circle of dancing and then the circle of dead bodies and then the, you know, camera rising up, I find very effective, very evocative. It works really well. I really love Tarf Allen. Um, I have always struggled to envision the White Tower, so being able to see it like this, it looks vaguely like Coit Tower in San Francisco, um, except with a broader base of a palace, and, you know, that's fine. I think it's much easier to visualize. Having it visualized as, like, a bone-white shaft sticking up out of a palace was always hard for me, and while I would not call this a bone-white shaft, sticking up out of a palace it it works um and i like it i think it looks great and it's an enormous building compared to the rest of the city and look i couldn't tell from the stills that we got where we had moraine standing in front of that arcade of windows but they do have north harbor there see it's not that hard to find guys this one thing that bugs me here is that I'm assuming that this is like Warder Rage. I think this is the Warder, his eyes said I must die. Um, that's why he's crying at the beginning with the memories. And then Egwene rises from the water to become legend, which I just, I love it. I love it. Um, so this Warder here, you see like Loghain's blown up the cage and then he's just like this covered in this like field of force there and the warder is jumping through the air doing this video game move with these axes and i hate these axes because they 
don't follow the laws of physics. You don't have a one-handed axe with a double bit. You can have a double-bitted axe that you hold with two hands because the laws of physics make it so that that long handle, you put a long handle on your axe, and with a heavy double bit, you know, you get plenty of force on it. Um, but a short axe like that, you would, having something counterbalance it like that, you would counteract the point of an axe. So that annoys me because that's just not how weapons work. But I do appreciate the fact that while they're doing the katana type weapons, you know, RJ doesn't have everybody use every single type of sword. Now everybody is always using like the two-handed swords um, in the Wheel of Time. And there are mentions of different types. Uh, I just finished reading The Shadow Rising and Bale Doman's sailors are described as boarding swords, which I'm assuming are cutlasses uh, or sabers. So these guys, who I'm guessing are Loghain's followers, have falcatas. Falcatas, or also called like a copus or copus, um, is a Greek type of sword. It actually has like a, mine's a little like flat on the back, but it has kind of a down curved point. And the point of it is to be fatter on it so that it has almost like an axe like heft to it. So that it has, you know, like weight to it. So it has a sword and it can be used for thrusting, but it's got a good like chop, chop, whack, like an ax. And I really appreciated seeing Loghain's guys outfitted with falcatas. The physics of those were great. The physics of these two-headed, single-handed axes, not so much. So thumbs down for those, thumbs up for falcatas. So, when I first watched this and I was watching Shatter Logoth, I thought it was on the ocean because this scene where Rand and Matt, I think it's Rand and Matt, are looking back because of how kind of hazed out everything is, where they're crawling up these this horrible looking rocky slope that looks miserable to you know to hike up. Um, that kind of hazed out area down there for Bit, I thought it was like a coastline or something and it wasn't until looking back on it that I saw that actually this is looks like grassy lowland area and this is just like a river and so it would be like oh yeah maybe Shatter Logoth is actually supposed to be on the RNL here and that it's just you know a weird brownish looking walled city um but looks really scary in the little scenes that they have and it looked really scary and I appreciate having rather than you know just a creepy murder mist having Mashadar be like a black zombie death plague creepy creeping zombie death plague or whatever I like that I think that it looks like bad news and yeah definitely something you need to outrun and it's creepy as hell so I think it works I work I like it. I think it works really well. And then this scene with Rant and Egwene. I'm glad that they aged the Emmons Fielders up. And I was hoping that they would be sluttier in the show. And it appears that my wish has been granted. It looks like it didn't go so well in this scene. And so my question is, I mean, first of all, who wants to bone on a bench like that? That does not look very comfortable. Secondly, did they do it or were they going to do it and Egwene decided she didn't want to, which that's my guess, or they did do it and it wasn't that great, or Egwene was having serious second thoughts, but I love the fact that they do all of this where they let you know just with wonderful like expressions and body language from Maddie that she's not that into Rand, you know, like the Queen's just not into Rand. Rand's smiling at her, like those still pictures that they had in Entertainment Weekly, he's grinning at her and she's got this look on her face like, yeah, about that, you know, and just like he smiles when she comes into the Wine Spring Inn here, which I'm assuming is after she has passed her right of her her courage right her right of adulthood um i'm wondering if they're gonna make the two rivers instead of being like a women's circle balancing the village council actually have it just be a matriarchy where 
women, you know, to pass the right to become women, you have to do this, like, you know, right of bravery, um, which is uh, cool. I like it. I think that's really cool. But I don't think that if they took a trip to the bone zone, it went very well. Um, if I had to guess, they were going to, and she's like, yeah, I'm not feeling this. I'm not into it. And I hope that because everybody always kind of feels sorry for a guy who gets shot down. It, I feel like the dialogue has changed enough now that people are much more respectful, at least in the real world, of a woman and her reasons for saying no or not being interested in someone. I don't know if it's translated as well to television, though, or to movies or media where a woman is just not into a dude and so she turns him down or is just not into him and everybody's like, you know, oh yeah, cool, she's not into you because Rand is so smiley and so cute and so sweet looking there he just oozes adorableness which i think is on purpose they want to make him as adorable as possible they want you to love him and find him so innocent and sweet and i think it's one of the reasons that they're going to have Logan. obviously he escapes here and maybe going to continue some kind of like reign of terror they want to introduce the dragon reborn in a way that is terrifying so that the audience most of whom presumably won't know anything about the wheel of time or the dragon or what all is involved with that will know that the dragon is bad news male channeling is bad news and will see effects like real-time effects of mail channeling and what's involved with it and know that it's scary and bad news and see effects of the taint on low gain and just see that it's bad bad news so that they've got all of the love and the feels for rand and his sweetness and his little smile and just look at he's so cute you just want to squeeze him look at him in his little fuzzy sweater you just want to like be like Oh, he's so adorable. He's such a nice looking kid. So knowing, seeing everything that happens with Loghain that they're going to play out and then be like, guess what? That adorable boy where everybody's probably going to feel sorry for him that Egwene isn't into him because I don't think that that whole like, well, she's not into him. So why should we feel sorry for him that is playing out now in real life where everybody's like, I don't know that that translates as well to film. I think in film, you know, everybody's going to have such feels for Rand that they might just think that Egwene's a bitch, which I think is sad because it's just sort of like Egwene, obviously, they're letting you know here she's got a destiny. And I love that they're showing us she's got a destiny first. And then later on, I'm assuming in the longer trailer that we're going to get, we're going to see more destiny for the boys and probably more mention of the dragon but i'm hoping maybe not too much you know it's like let other people find out about it let's have the dragon be terrifying first let's have just all of the horror and everything um have all that built up he's so wholesome and one of the things that I love too here, and I never pointed it out when I was kind of gushing over their costumes in my um, video where I talk about the EW photo shoot, is how much I love that it looks like Matt's like some drunken hipster in a bathrobe. His thing looks like a bathrobe, and I dig it. I really do. It so works for him and his just total outfit and his presentation. He's just like your drunk ass college roommate or whatever wandering around in his bathrobe the whole time he really would totally fit in portland oregon <sighs> he would go to work just in a bathrobe and be like this isn't a bathrobe this is it's a sweater it's a cardigan i bought it at goodwill it's it's not a bathrobe and you wouldn't fight about it even if you knew he was full of shit because it nobody cares nobody cares anyway I can't wait to see the next thing that they let out because, damn, um, I really appreciate you watching my videos. I love doing these videos for content for Watt on Prime, and um, I am looking forward to doing another one soon. 
please like them, or even if you don't like them, dislike them. Any attention is better than no attention. Uh, please subscribe if you want to get some more. Um, and yeah, listen to my podcast if you haven't and you like the Wheel of Time book series. I talk very in depth about topics to do with the Wheel of Time. I'm following the series along. Like I said, I just finished The Shadow Rising, and so I'm just about to start taking notes to begin my season four podcast episodes where I am going to talk about themes and scenes, characters and relationships, all of that good stuff where I get real nerdy and academic about it because that's how I roll. So awesome. Thanks for coming to the YouTube version of Podcast of the Dragon. And I guess I'm getting better at signing this off. Still haven't figured out how to do it and sound like smooth there's there's no music yet there's no music there's no animation we're doing our best here